Well, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you may be uh, tuning in from uh, today. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce two very distinguished uh, speakers, discussants uh, for today's conversation about media coverage uh, of the war in Ukraine. I could make elaborate introductions. I'll just do the briefest of introductions because these are two such distinguished figures, Clarissa Ward uh, of CNN uh, and Joshua Yaffa uh, of the uh, of the New Yorker. And before we uh, delve into our conversation, I did want to thank the Carnegie Corporation for its generous support of the Monterey Conversations and thank as well uh, Anna Vasilyeva of the Monterey uh, Institute of International Studies uh, and Altanai Yunusova of the same Institute for their uh, help and for making all of this uh, possible. So to our audience, just to ready yourselves, please do insert questions through the Q&A function uh, and uh, I will read them and uh, ask them in about 40 minutes uh, time. You're sort of welcome to put those questions uh, in uh, at any moment. And, you know, with that by way of introduction, uh, you know, let's uh, dive right in. My first, you know, sort of category of questions, and perhaps we could start with you, Clarissa, and then uh, go on to uh, to Josh, uh, is about the challenges of covering uh, a major war uh, and uh, where you feel that access to information uh, is difficult, where you may feel that uh, social media, which is a big component of the war, uh, is potentially an obstacle uh, to getting good journalism across or to getting accurate information across. Uh, and, you know, in addition, uh, the challenge of covering a war that is in many ways profoundly regional, uh, but also a war that is profoundly global uh, as well. And so there's, you know, the Middle East aspect of this war and there's the Asia aspect of this war and the U.S. aspect of it and the European aspect of it. And of course, the Russian and Ukraine, Ukrainian aspects of it. And I would imagine that that itself is quite a, uh, a challenge in terms of the coverage. So starting with you, Clarissa, if you could just reflect uh, uh, on the difficulties that you face or maybe the things that you worry about when it, when it comes to covering this war. So first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm very excited to be with you. Um, and as I mentioned, I just got back from three and a half weeks in Ukraine. So I have I have some thoughts on this subject. Um, there are many challenges to covering any war. I would say for me personally, I have found the biggest challenge with covering this war has actually been less about the Ukrainian side and more about the lack of access to the Russian side and the kind of difficulty of doing really good reporting inside Russia at the moment. So CNN is very lucky in the sense that we still have two reporters who are able to, um, ha who have held on to their Russian credentials and can continue to travel to Russia. But there are onerous restrictions put upon their movements, the kinds of reporting they do, some of them by the Russian state, some of them by CNN out of an abundance of caution. And the long and the short of it is that it becomes increasingly difficult to get a really good picture of, of what exactly is happening in Russia. And I'm not talking about within the Kremlin, right? Because there's a level of opaqueness with regards to that, that you're you're always going to have to contend with, even in a much more friendly environment. I'm even talking about um, the zeitgeist. I'm talking about mobilization. I'm talking about speaking to Russian soldiers, ordinary Russian families. So that has made it, I think, very difficult to get a clear picture of exactly what's going on. That's one challenge. Uh, on the Ukrainian side, there is an incredible media savvy, I would say from Ukrainian authorities, a deep understanding of the importance of having media operating and telling their story. There are naturally a lot of restrictions as well on access um, that journalists, particularly in frontline areas where I was now just in the sort of around Kherson region, um, it's incredibly difficult to try to get to the front lines, to try to spend time with um, Ukrainian military units that are actually engaged in serious um, fighting as opposed to, okay, we'll take you out and fire off a couple of tank rounds and you can call it a day and you got your picture and 
Um, that's obviously not terribly interesting for us in terms of trying to paint a broader picture. So access can be difficult. I would say that's something that I've experienced in most wars that I've covered though. And there is a, a natural desire from any military or most militaries not to want journalists to get um, injured or killed. And we have seen, unfortunately, far too many journalists were injured and killed, particularly early on in this conflict. And so I think that's part of the reason you see resistance from the Ukrainian military. I think obviously there's an operational security component as well, all of which is to say, coming to your second point, we become hugely reliant in many ways on open source information and videos that are being posted online by multiple you know, different actors in this conflict. And what that really then necessitates is something like that is beyond what I can do as an individual with the demands on me to be going live regularly, filing stories regularly. That sort of requires within CNN its own unit that literally comb through video after video translate, attempt to verify, attempt to geolocate, attempt to see if the person who's posted it is a trusted source and have they posted other videos. And it's extremely time consuming. And I think at the end of it, it has really been very helpful in terms of putting together a slightly deeper picture of what's going on. But you have to obviously approach it with a huge amount of caution because there is a ton of misinformation out there, a ton of disinformation out there. And often in the fog of war, things are misrepresented willfully or inadvertently. So it's made our job incredibly challenging. Um, I had some experience dealing with that, covering Syria for 10 years, because while people talk about like Ukraine being the first war being fought on social media, I actually think it was Syria, really, that was the first war where every Friday you would see people marching in these protests, you know, into a hail of bullets, often carrying their cell phones above their heads. And then we would all be back home trying to parse through the cell phone footage and get a better picture of what was actually going on. So this is a kind of new normal for for covering conflict around the world. But and we're getting more sophisticated tools to deal with it. But it is nonetheless challenging. On the sort of second part of your question, you, you know, the sort of geopolitical global angle versus the local angle uh, in terms of storytelling. I would say Ukraine has actually been a less challenging story to tell um, for our audience, at least, than something like Syria, for example, which was extremely complex, extremely nuanced, and perhaps not immediately clear to an American viewer where they fit in or why they care beyond, you know, caring for the sake of humanity. In Ukraine, for, for, for a number of reasons, this is a story that has really captured the imagination of not just people in the U.S., but I think many people around the world, and particularly in the West, because it has become a, you know, a sort of paradigm for this moment that we're living in and this existential battle, as many people would see it, between democracy and authoritarianism. So I have actually found it less hard to engage the audience and to continue to engage the audience. What are we now, nine months later, even though it is still a story which is complex and nuanced and layered and often has, you know, towns and villages with 10 syllable names that people find hard to retain. And, you know, this is a television audience. It's it's a different audience to, to, to Joshua's, which doesn't mean there aren't, you know, sophisticated consumers as well, but it's just a different type of reportage and storytelling. So I have been pleasantly surprised to see how much um, Ukraine uh, has resonated with people and how I think that also, you know, in addition to the kind of, you know, the battle of authoritarianism versus democracy, there's also this sort of American uh, 
um, natural affinity with the kind of the underdog story. And, and I don't think anyone realized at the beginning of this war that this would end up becoming a story of this extraordinary transformation from what seemed like it was going to be a blitzkrieg and Kiev was going to be taken in three days and the whole thing was going to be over to Russia really on the ropes. Putin, I would argue, I'd be curious to hear Josh's thoughts on this, but facing his first like existential challenge in arguably 20 years and the Russian military, you know, um, their incompetence laid bare for the world to see. So for the, for those two reasons, I have found the storytelling part of it um, less challenging than, than maybe other conflicts I've carried covered. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Clarissa. I'm very eager to get your thoughts, Josh, uh, comparing uh, the unit that uh, Clarissa mentions at CNN uh, that helps to deal with, with accuracy in an age of social media with the legendary fact checking uh, of the uh, of the New Yorker, I wonder if these are sort of comparable or uh, or different units. And we'll just you know very briefly repeat the question. The first part of it about how one can arrive at accuracy uh, to the best of one's abilities, and then uh, the balance between the local and the global. I just wanted to add one further category uh, in terms of the articles you've been writing, Josh, about the war in Ukraine over the last couple of months, which is the individual, because uh, it does seem like a lot of your Reporting has focused on individual testimony, sometimes related to atrocities, sometimes related simply to the uh, to the experience of the war. And I'm curious how you sort of weave that in with the local, the regional, the national, uh, and the international. So, so Josh, we we pass the baton to you. Sure. Thanks uh, so much, uh, Michael, and, and glad to be here with you and to listen to Clarissa. I really enjoyed her op opening comments and um, I'm tempted just to say I, I second most, most of, of what she said rather than to try and clumsily um, come up with my own uh, addition to it was already uh, a quite articulate and, and comprehensive, I think, distillation of what it's like um, to try and cover the war. Um, indeed, uh, this notion of, of making sense of the Facts surrounding the war, you know, where does one look for them? How does one verify them, uh, pass them on to the reader or viewer, consumer of news? Those are all questions that I'm not sure I've settled on a formula that feels uh, that I'm kind of uniformly um, comfortable or confident in that I feel like works in all situations across Ukraine. It's, it's constantly um, both a situation of trial and error, but also kind of fraught one where I often feel like I'm not always sure of, uh, at least right away, you know, how to make sense of a story that I've heard you arrive in a new village, one, the most recent area of Ukraine that I was in uh, um, about two or three weeks ago, um, was the area surrounding Kharkiv, uh, particularly the city of Izum and some other smaller towns and cities in that area that had been occupied for Russia for uh, by Russian forces for six or seven months and then liberated in a counteroffensive in, in September. And you arrive to these places relatively freshly liberated. They would have been uh, liberated for about two weeks um, or so when by the time I arrived. And, and they're just overflowing with stories, both about the liberation, about how the Ukrainian army re-entered the town, but also, of course, about the nature of occupation, which often was a quite dark and brutal um, affair, but also one in which a fair number, a, a minority, but still a fair number of locals uh, participated in one form or another, um, taking jobs in the occupation administration, carrying out various services and tasks. And now I arrive um, and, and, and listen to these testimonies, which are just pouring out of people, which are, and, and they're incredibly fascinating and rich, and it feels like some of the most um, important or at least gripping journalistic material that's available, but it's also really um, stream of consciousness and scattershot and laced with understandable emotion and trauma and pain and confusion. And the fog of war uh, pertains not just to those trying to cover it, to us journalists, but to those in the middle of it. And sometimes, the, as Clarissa, I'm sure, can attest, you know, the closer you are to the kind of hot core of the war, to the actual um, uh, to the fighting itself and to the, where the battles are taking place, the more confusing things get. And so even in a place like Izum, occupied for seven months, that both is the very place you want to be to get the stories of occupation, but in fact, where those stories can be the most tangled um, and confused. And, and what I've found is that the best method 
methods for making sense of that are simply the you know, classic tools of, of journalism. There's not really a particularly complicated formula here, just in terms of trying to get the same story or a version of a story or an incident episode from as many people as possible, going back to the same people. Um, as Clarissa mentioned, you know, it's one has to contend with purposeful misinformation, but also the genuine confusion and trauma of war in which a person, him or herself, may not always, um, sort of the first time around, tell the most um, accurate story or maybe uh, themselves kind of confused, traumatized, and so on. And so going back to the same person, I find, can also be helpful in trying to get them to narrate the same experience multiple times. And, and over time, um, you can begin to become more confident. And while checking that with other stories you're hearing around town, and, and like I said, none of this is particularly new or, or revelatory. These are really the same skills or techniques I might have used in, in other places. And, and I guess I've had no option but to rely on the skills and, and habits and working methods I had going into this war because I'm an, an accidental uh, and maybe not particularly at, at all the time willing or enthusiastic war reporter. Um, un unlike Clarissa, whose experience I, I admire deeply and really am in awe of um, her work in Syria and elsewhere. Um, you know, my beat, uh, the, the, I knew Russia, I knew Ukraine, I knew the, the region, and, and that certainly gives advantages, first and foremost, in terms of language, um, but also just in understanding context, history, and so on. But, but I don't really know um, organized violence and uh, the matters of, of war. And so there's been a steep learning curve in trying to understand um, the mechanics of war um, and, and trying to understand the mechanics of this war, um, which both has many particularities, but also perhaps even more universalities in terms of the way um, modern wars are, are conducted. Um, but I've, I've brought to this war the skills and experience I have, which, which are grounded in a different toolkit. And I found that it's been more productive, I hope, um, uh, to call on where I feel comfortable and what I think I'm good at. Um, uh, and to not necessarily, for example, chase, and, and you're right to point this out, although I have written some stories about the military situation. Um, I went to Donbass in June at the height of the artillery war there and, and wrote a story that was really about the balance of power between the Russian and Ukrainian armies, about the use of artillery. Um, Western artillery, U.S. artillery was just then beginning to feed uh, into Ukrainian, into the Ukrainian arsenal was just beginning to appear on on the battlefield in Donbass, and I was trying to make sense of what could we expect from this inclusion in the war. So that was one case where I wrote a story that felt, to my mind, at least more exclusively focused on the military situation. I wrote another one recently, a longer report that's almost more a diplomatic piece than a military one about how the U.S.-Ukrainian relationship developed over time at the at the highest levels, whether Biden and Zelensky or the defense ministers, the heads of uh, respective armed forces and about how the U.S. came to supply more and more weapons. But those, I would say, are exceptions in my coverage. And I've more focused on the kind of pieces that, that you highlighted, Michael, which is looking at the individual experience, um, playing to both my um, skills, I hope, but um, also kind of comfort and where I feel like I can make a contribution. And that's bringing to life the experience of war as it's lived by the people who found themselves they're accidentally, horrifically in the middle of it, not just those who suffered uh, in terms of atrocities and violence, but those who, for example, in a place like Azum, saw their city occupied and then had to live in that strange and macabre uh, reality for um, half a year. And, and that, I think, plays into the classic approach of The New Yorker, um, which I've, in a way, I guess, come to imbibe or embody as my own. I don't know the chicken egg relationship there in terms of I've lost track at this point. What are my journalistic proclivities and, and what are those of the magazine that I've happily learned from and incorporated? But that, um, you know, the, the smaller the story, the better is, is uh, one perhaps slightly garbled New Yorker axiom. Um, but that, in fact, when you're writing something at length of seven, eight thousand words that can take, you know, 10 pages or more in the magazine, the smaller the aperture, the better, actually. Um, and that that's a way to make the storytelling more vivid, uh, to make the characters really leap off the page, to give readers a sense of uh, an intimate 
experience and getting to know the tactile human um, experience and sensation of, of war that the fewer number of characters, the fewer number of, um, kind of set pieces, uh, the better. And, um, and that also plays into, I hope, this question of accuracy and, and fidelity, right? When you're, when you're trying to capture less, um, when you're sort of covering less area, but going deeper, that's a real privilege and advantage of the kind of work that the New Yorker allows me to do. And, and while I'm not sure that, you know, we always do that perfectly, I think the fog of war is to a certain degree un, unconquerable or unsurmountable. Um, entirely, that's given me the chance, like I've said, to go back to places and go back to characters over and over again and feel like I'm at least um, a little bit more on terra firma in the way I'm describing a situation than I might have been um, if I had just spent an hour or a day um, with uh, a story. And of course, uh, I would be remiss not to, to use your assist to, to praise the New Yorker fact-checking department, which really is a marvelous um, institution and one that gives me great um, comfort and confidence. Um, and I, I try not to abuse this privilege of working with such wonderful um, colleagues like uh, Anya Kardunsky and um, David Kortava and others who um, uh, are the Russian speaking specialists in the department um, there, but, but they're really like a second, not just a second pair of eyes and ears on a story, but auxiliary reporters in the sense that they can uncover um, stories, episodes, things I missed, things I either missed with characters and reporting, or as you and Clarissa both mentioned, maybe things in the fire hose of social media on a particular subject, even though I'm trying my best when I'm working on a particular story to set alerts, monitor Twitter, do all of that to capture um, news items that pertain to this particular slice of the war I'm interested in. Of course, I can't get everything and, and to have extra eyes and ears um, is a great, um, is a great um, privilege. And I, I hope that the final product, I mean, to, to me, it feels solid uh, and, and knowing the work that goes into it. Um, I know that it's certainly the result of the best and earnest effort of a lot of smart people. And I, and I hope to, to the reader, it feels if not exactly like a kind of canonical version of the war, because there can be no such thing. This war is too sprawling and, and, and terrible um, a story kind of with a capital S for it to ever be embodied or encapsulated by one particular particular um, article. But but I've enjoyed um, the, the privileges of a slower metabolism, which is just kind of accidental benefit of the format uh, of the New Yorker. Well, thank you so much, Josh. It's a it's a it's a very helpful segue into my next question about the story, as you put it, with a capital S. So it's often, you know, said that journalism is the first draft of of history, which I think is uh, is true. And the historians who will come later will have a certain advantage over the journalists in the sense that they will be able to say five, ten years from now what the arc of the war uh, is, and that's to us, you know, sort of unknowable. Uh, in real time. But I did want to ask, starting again with Clarissa, about how one arrives at the big picture. Clarissa, you mentioned the blitzkrieg of the first couple of days and a common expectation in Washington and elsewhere that the war might be over quickly and that there would be a kind of Russian military uh, dominance uh, and that would be the story of the war. That's obviously not the war that's unfolded before uh, our eyes. You have the kind of grinding war of attrition uh, in uh, June and August, and then, uh, as you mentioned, Josh, the sort of lightning Ukrainian victories of September, and of course, we've just uh, uh, learned of a, uh, of a, you know, sort of promised and I think possible retreat uh, of Russian forces from uh, from Kherson. So, as viewers, we don't necessarily have to make these decisions as to where it all fits together, but I think as journalists, you you must, you can't really avoid that question of the big picture. So, I'm very curious to get your thoughts, Clarissa, about how one does that in real time with you know all of this information flowing in and and uh, as you've both mentioned the fog of war uh, as a as a sort of pertinent fact with great humility <laughs> is what i would say because even before the initial incarnation where intelligence agencies were telling us you know kiev's going to fall in 3 or 4 days we had the two or three weeks where I was sitting in Kyiv 
uh, along with many other journalists and Russia experts who were saying, this is ludicrous. There's no way Vladimir Putin is going to invade Ukraine. It doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. You know, the stakes are too high. He has never, you know, engaged in folly. And this would be folly. Um, and, and, I, and I think many of us genuinely believe that. Until he gave this speech, I think two days before the war actually began, where, you know, he sort of went on this 57 minute diatribe about <clears throat> whether Ukraine really had any right to exist as a sovereign state um, and seemed to be definitely concluding that the answer was no, at, at which point we all realized that we had it all completely wrong. Um, and then once there was this sort of extraordinary uh, opening salvo on the night the war started. I was in Kharkiv. My colleague was in Kiev. Bombs were, you know, lighting up the sky. People were camping in the metro. And and then again, you were in a different phase of the war where you thought this is going to be absolutely relentless and horrific and is going to be over soon, but who knows what it's going to look like. And then again, <laughs> Um, the Russians were forced to pull out of the north. It was a disaster. Uh, it was humiliating. And as you mentioned, the grinding war of attrition in Donbass earlier in the summer and then the lightning offenses of September. And I, I get asked all the time to try to predict what's going to happen next and how this war will end and where it will go. I have always felt instinctively, and again, I am often wrong, but that it will grind on for quite a while longer. Um, I know, I think that sometimes there's a tendency um, in the West, particularly in the US, particularly there's this kind of exuberance. Anytime there's a successful counteroffensive, it's like this sort of, oh yes, like the Ukrainians are going to do it. And, you know, I do think the Ukrainians probably can do it and will do it, but it's not going to happen overnight, I don't believe. And I also think it's a mistake to underestimate how important this war has become for Putin. Uh, and when I talk to people who are not close to Putin per se, but close to people in that sphere and who share that ideology, they're very clear that losing this war is not an option. Now, I don't think they know exactly how to win it. Um, but I do think when you have a level of conviction that deep that you're not willing to lose it, you're willing to throw everything but the kitchen sink. And I talk to people who say, you know, we've got to just start taking over all the factories, put them on a war footing. It's a war economy. Let's start making ammunition and stop making, you know, whatever we were making before. So I think there are, are still many yet incarnations that um, will potentially play out in this war, some of which we can probably predict, some of which invariably are unpredictable. Um, and so for that reason, when you are trying to present this to a viewer or a listener or a reader, I do feel this weight of responsibility where I am more comfortable always. I mean, a big part of my job is doing analysis on panels and whatever, not like this, but like on television. Um, but I am always more comfortable talking about what I know and what I can see and what I can feel and, and what I am hearing from people who are living through it and who have a much better ultimately understanding or feeling for the reality uh, of, of, you know, this war on the ground, wherever they may be. So I think that as long as I, I you know, and I do think this is part of the kind of social media war, uh, well, sorry, world, not war, although there is a social media war as well. Um, the social media world we live in where everyone feels obliged to have their hot take, right? And, and and this is why Twitter becomes like kind of unbearable because as much as I find it really interesting to read everybody's hot takes, it becomes less about like, what are people on the ground saying? What are people on the ground seeing? What does it like feel like there? Give me a sense of that reality. And it becomes more about people in Washington um, coming up with like really clever hot takes that may well be true. And that kind of, then you'll go to like these conferences in the US with lots of super smart people. And you'll talk to General Petraeus and he'll say, you know, the 
this is irreversible, right? The momentum that the Ukraine, and, and I'm not disputing, he may well be right. But my point is you get into that kind of group think mentality, right? Where everybody's sharing in this exuberance, everybody's like, let's go Ukraine. And as a journalist, maybe not as an analyst, maybe not as an academic, you know, maybe not as a, you know, a, a general offering opinions about the war, but as a journalist, I feel like it's a little dangerous to immerse oneself too much into that world. It's useful to consume and understand like what the thinking is back home about the war over there. But then I always find I come away humbled when I actually go and spend a month in Ukraine. I'm like, oh, OK, this is a little different than what everybody is saying at, you know, wine cocktail parties in Washington. So, yeah, I guess the long and the short of it is that you give people a very real sense of what you're seeing and hearing on the ground to the best of your ability. And, you know, within the parameters of, as you know, Josh was saying, like the most rigorous reporting you can do with, you know, all the facts that you can glean. And then you offer analysis to help people contextualize it. But for me personally, I am always a little bit reticent to prognosticate, um, partly because there are a lot smarter people who can do that better than I can, and partly because I don't know that it's necessarily that helpful. Um, and often, as I said, leads us in these kind of like vicious cycles of like, this is what's going to happen with the war. And then three weeks later, we're in a totally different cycle of like, this is what's going to happen with the war than this. And the reality is like the one thing I'm pretty confident about is that almost every war I've covered has ended in some kind of a negotiated settlement. I thought it was pretty extraordinary when I was in Ukraine. I had some meetings like, you know, sort of off the record with various people close to the government who were like, there's no way we're talking about negotiations. There's no way we're talking about settlements. There's no way we're talking about concessions. We're talking now, not just about getting Russia out of Ukraine. We're talking about like regime change in Russia. Like that's how mad we are. And that's how hell bent we are on, on getting justice to where we are now. We're in the last three days. Zelensky's like, well, we would consider negotiations, but they have to be good faith negotiations and Russia has to be willing to like prove that they would be serious, um, good faith negotiations. So there is often, <laughs> you have to be kind of flexible in your approach when you're covering war and when you're telling stories about war and you have to understand that as a journalist, often you are being duped too right and 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 part of the sort of project of whoever it may be whether it's the zelensky government whether it's the us government is to make you think one thing while actually they're trying to push for something else so i guess my question would be have the americans been putting a lot of pressure on the zelensky government to seriously consider negotiations and were you know was the Ukrainian government really resisting that a lot? And is this significant? Anyway, I don't want to get lost in the weeds on that. But my point being that um, things can change and things always do change. And the only thing I could ever say with any confidence about every war I've covered is that they they usually end in some form of negotiated settlement, but only once people, and I don't mean the government, I mean people feel that they have some form of catharsis or some form of it can be catharsis it can be justice it can also be that they're broken um but the people have to get to the place where they're ready to take that next step and to and to and to let go and move on basically i don't think the ukrainian people are there yet but Ultimately, I think they will probably have to get there. I mean, it's 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 very striking to get that notion. It just reminds me of of, of Aristotle when he used the word catharsis because it's how he described the function of, of tragedy. Uh, and I think it's in a sense easy to agree that this war is a great tragedy. 
Uh, and Aristotle also said that a tragedy has a beginning, a middle, uh, and an end in terms of, uh, of the narrative. And I, so, I suppose that just sort of underscores the difficulty of describing the beginning of the middle without knowing uh, the end. I think it's a very helpful distinction that Clarissa makes between the narrative of the war, which is often ambiguous and certainly very complicated, and what you could describe as the political narrative of the war. And that's, uh, as Clarissa mentions, is particular to, to Ukraine, to Russia, to the U.S., to the to the countries that have a stake in this uh, in this conflict. And so just pausing for a moment to remind our audience that they can send in questions to the Q&A function uh, and we'll get to them when uh, uh, when we have a moment, uh, when we have time for, for questions. But before we turn to audience's questions, I did want to ask the same question of you, uh, Josh, about the big picture. And perhaps you'd want to respond to what Clarissa mentions about the multiple intersecting and conflicting political narratives of this uh, of this global war, uh, and then the overall, you know, sort of problem of, of of coming up with a true narrative, perhaps challenging some of those political narratives, perhaps coming up with a narrative uh, of your own as as you arrive, you know, Im impromptu and and you know day by day at uh, your own sense of the big picture of this uh, of this conflict. It, it certainly has been. Interesting uh, and, and fraught and exciting and, and, and complicated to, to write about a story as big as this one, which really is, um, uh, it's first and foremost a terrible um, shooting war with great human tragedy as a result, but it's also um, a political war. I mean, as, as all wars are by definition, um, a narrative war, um, a social media war <laughs> in, in Clarissa's, um, I think, um, helpful um, Freudian slip. Uh, it, uh, I think it you know, can um, hold up to that classification also, um, which makes it different. Uh, I don't know whether of kind or, or, or degree, I'd have to think about it, but, but definitely different um, than other stories I've covered where I've been able to go deep on an issue that certainly isn't, um, let's say, before I write about it, trending on Twitter or on TV the whole time. I mean, that's, um, in a way, the idiosyncratic pleasure of writing for a place like The New Yorker, which is like the last big story I wrote for the magazine, which came out in January of 2022, which feels like a lifetime ago, um, was about the thawing of the Arctic permafrost and its implications for climate cycles, warming in the Arctic. I mean, an, an important issue. It wasn't like I plucked it out of obscurity, but it also wasn't something, I wasn't writing into a maelstrom of um, really uh, kind of passionate, uh, already formed opinion and discussion on the topic. And that's to say nothing of another piece from 2021 about the only African-American communist um, who, to die in the gulag, uh, um, uh, a communist from Texas who ended up in Moscow and was a victim of the purges, which was definitely as anti-news cycle as it gets. Um, and in a way that was honestly where my comfort zone lied. I, I, I liked the uh, ability without pressure either internally or externally imposed to find these stories and pursue them um, both with a luxury of time, knowing that there was no real deadline pressure you were racing against, but also to, to write into um, an environment in which you weren't immediately, you know, adding to or being unwitting party of or combating this narrative war about the meaning of the war and its trajectory. But that's, all of that is, uh, true to a heightened degree in a way I've never experienced in writing about uh, anything else. And that's to be expected. It's natural. It's obvious. How could it be otherwise, given the stakes um, of this war and the investment, whether on the side of, of the Kremlin, um, the Ukrainian people for whom this war is understandably uh, existential? I think it'd be, it's hard to sort of argue with uh, the overwhelming majority of Ukrainian society who um, who sees this war as a question as a, as a matter of the survival of, of the Ukrainian state uh, and nation, or audiences in the West, the U.S. in particular, who see various uh, I think it's fair to say kind of proxy meanings or or proxy points of relevance and import in this war. That yes, it's a 
about Ukraine defending itself from Russian invasion, but it has that has implications for Western societies and the degree to which the United States should be involved in that fight is one that has some political valiance in the US, even though it's, I think most readers and viewers um, have this a, a knee jerk reaction to support the underdog, as Clarissa said, or on the side of kind of you know, democracy in this larger um, existential struggle that does seem definitive for this moment in the 21st century. But there's just a lot of uh, emotion and preconceived opinion about this war and, and, and writing into that is, um, as I said in the beginning of my answer, both both kind of exhilarating, the, that's, it, it makes you feel like you should rise to the occasion, but also um, fraught and also intimidating and, and also cause for reflection and pause just to make sure that you're not becoming an unwitting agent um, in those narrative wars or um, other kind of struggles um, within the war in which each side has an agenda, including the Ukrainian side, um, which as I said, and I think is worth, it can't be repeated enough just to understand the Ukrainian mentality and what the war feels like from inside Ukraine, that this is a war for the survival of the country. It is, it is just inherently or definitionally existential. And so um, that gives you a sense of the, of the stakes that not just the Ukrainian political leadership, but much of the Ukrainian public has toward this war. So of course, they're going to have heightened interest and care and attention to how that war is presented, especially in the West, um, on whom Ukraine depends for much of its arsenal uh, at this point, the, the means by which Ukraine is waging this war. It certainly, one should never downplay Ukrainian military um, ingenuity and the bravery and commitment of its armed forces, meaning the people who are actually doing the fighting and dying on behalf of the Ukrainian state. Um, but that said, at this point in the war, Western provided munitions um, are an essential part of, of Ukraine's war fighting capability. So that gives obvious um, stakes and implications to Western societies, the United States, um, most of all. But how, how to describe all of that without without being seen as adding narrative momentum um, or confirmation or the opposite being seen as to be somehow antagonistic to certain narratives, um, it becomes very difficult to do the classic journalistic work of, of doing your best to describe things as they are. Um, because like in all wars, but perhaps with each passing war, this only becomes more true, the degree to which information itself is weaponized and becomes uh, a central part of the war and a central battlefield, you end up, whether you like it or not, um, I, I hope not as a combatant on that battlefield, but but you're, you're sort of there, you, you, you can't, it would be uh, foolish and naive to declare that you you don't exist or you're not present on that battlefield, you, you are. And then that um, requires a lot of careful thought that I'm not sure I have reached a place that I exactly know what the formula is to make sure that you're able to do your job professionally and accurately and, and usefully first and foremost, right? I, I mean, I, I, my goal is to tell stories that are both uh, interesting, that, that in and of themselves are in some way gripping reads or, or reads that, that capture and hold people's attention, but that also um, are performing a service in explaining what the war feels like in translating the human experience, but also in helping readers make sense of the uh, larger stakes and context um, of the war. Um, how to do that without being, uh, you know, ending up as a protagonist in that story is difficult, especially returning to what Clarissa said at the beginning, which is there's just a objective imbalance in terms of access, both inside Ukraine itself, um, the Ukrainian military for reasons that uh, are understandable, um, but has become even more uh, careful. And I think it's fair to say standoffish at times stingy in terms of access to um, Ukrainian military units and Ukrainian military operations uh, as is their right, but that just makes it harder 
to understand or, or let alone pass along with great fidelity what the actual picture is, what the condition of Ukrainian forces, what, you know, to make these kinds of, um, if not predictions, at least analytical judgments about the trajectory of the war when we don't understand fully the condition of, of one of the war's um, main fighting forces. And we have even less of a uh, clear picture of the other uh, side of the war, the Russian military, where there's basically zero access unless you're credentialed through uh, Moscow, through the Russian foreign ministry or Russian defense ministry, which is um, a very um, fraught and difficult um, affair and, and one that would be hard to manage with, I think, journalistic integrity. That's a kind of lose-lose um, proposition in a way. And, and so we're left um, in a zone of real opacity, which is um, which is frustrating and, 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 and I think requires us to be open with readers and viewers, um, as, as Clarissa has mentioned repeatedly, with, with a kind of humility about how much we don't know. Um, you know, that can be sometimes not a winning message to put on the page or to put on, on screen <laughs> to lead with uh, everything you don't know. Um, <laughs> but the, the trick, I guess, is to find enough that you you can speak about with authority um, that is interesting and, and grabs attention and that gives you the legitimacy and the cover to then be forthright about everything that you don't know. The, the known knowns and the known uh, unknowns <laughs> in, in, in the parlance of, 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 of Donald Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld, who I know you were not at all trying to evoke, Josh, but uh, um, let me now start to incorporate our audience questions. They're coming in uh, uh, at a nice clip uh, and start with the first one. I'll start with you, Josh, and, and then turn to, to, to you, Clarissa, just to mix up the order for a moment um, about <clears throat> the dangers of, of being in a war zone uh, and how you manage that. And, you know, if you want to offer you know, sort of personal reflections uh, on this, in other words, it doesn't have to be a question answered in the abstract. You can sort of answer it through your personal experiences, what it's like to uh, to sort of be in a war zone and uh, how you try to stay safe uh, in a in a war that's, um, you know, very far, far ranging. And as both of you said, both uh, a war that's that's sort of fundamentally unpredictable. So, so we'll start with you, Josh, and then turn to you, Clarissa, about just the nature of reporting from a war zone. Well, I'll, I'll return to my. Um description of, of myself as an accidental war reporter, which is certainly true for how my experience of, of this war began uh, on February 24th in Kramatorsk in Donbass, um, where I was when the, the missiles there started falling. And, um, you know, neither I nor the New Yorker had a particularly uh, rigorous or detailed um, protocol for for sort of what to do in case of war. I wasn't traveling with a security team. Um, you know, I was working with some modifications, certainly a higher degree of interest, support, care, resources from the home office in New York, but I was still working in the classic New Yorker mold that I was used to. One guy, in my case, um, with a backpack and a notebook sort of unleashed on the world to go find something interesting. Um, and uh, that's how I spent the first two weeks um, of the war. Quickly came together with some colleagues and a wonderful uh, fixer and now friend from from Kramatorsk who we uh, kidnapped, uh, as we joked, and, and, and uh, had him drive us back to Kiev, where he ended up staying in a hotel room with us for the next three weeks in Kiev, where we became fast uh, fast friends. Uh, and that's how I wrote my first long report for the New Yorker in this style of um, improvisation where the questions about security in, the, in those early tense days in Kiev, where certainly the Russian intention was to seize the city and to have troops enter the very center of, of the capital. And it wasn't sure, it wasn't clear in those days whether that would happen or not. And there I was in Kiev doing my best to figure out on my own, you know, where to go, how to move, how to stay safe. Um, and luckily kind of managed to through calling on the advice and collective wisdom of um, of colleagues. Later in the war, in fact, very quickly, the New Yorker moved to a model that has become common for news organizations, uh, whether in print like New York Times or certainly on television like CNN and others, and that there's there are 
security consultants, this um, wonderful and, and wonderfully helpful and wonderfully um, confidence inducing, I found, uh, um, team uh, of analyst advisors, um, people with experience in conflict in one form or another that, that sort of take charge of those questions. I don't want to say if I outsource questions of security entirely to them, that would be both an incorrect and, and sort of unwise of me to completely uh, entrust my, my own safety to others and not worry about it myself. I still you know, try and, and keep an eye on things and be sensible and, and responsible, but it's certainly been a great confidence boost to know that there are professionals, that, that everyone on the team has their kind of discrete professional experience and responsibility. And it's made, given me a lot of confidence to move around Ukraine and to do stories that are ambitious and uh, have, have the right degree of ambition and adventure to them, hopefully not crossing the line into something foolhardy, but that um, by not having me be solely responsible and having to kind of furrow my brow and, and think through, you know, can I do this or not? Can I go there or not? To have um, someone whose opinion and experience is it's much more vast and reliable than my own um, kind of frees me, liberates me to, to then um, devote, you know, whatever percentage of my brain, uh, some portion of it back to journalistic and repertorial questions, which I, which I think is hopefully productive for the overall, uh, the overall process. And Clarissa, you know, it's, uh, I can think of two salient differences perhaps in the sense that you're not an accidental wartime reporter. You've mentioned reporting from, from Syria and it's not the first war that you've covered. And of course the medium of television is just by nature different from long form, uh, print journalism. So I just wanted to ask the same question of you mm -hmm. about reporting from a war zone and a, and a, and a danger zone and, and sort of how, how you do it and, 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 and how you manage the difficulties of it. Yeah, it is. It is very different because I sometimes really envy Joshua. He's like, you know, I've got my backpack and my pad. And, and now if I go, I'm like, oh my God, I've got like six people, three cars, <laughs> two cameras, like, so much stuff, you know, it's, we have a big footprint, um, in television and we do try to minimize it for certain assignments. Um, but you also have to, you know, be prepared for any situation, be ready to go live in any situation. So you, you need to have the gear that you need to have. Um, and I totally agree with Josh that having a security consultant, it's interesting because I've been covering war for a long time. There have been a lot of instances where having these security consultants has, has actually been kind of challenging, particularly in places like Syria or Afghanistan, where, you know, going around with a huge former British Special Forces guys with tattoos and like Oakley sunglasses is actually not the look you're really going for. <laughs> and you're really trying to get, you know, a little more low profile or, you know, sometimes even go undercover. Um, it's been challenging um, finding that kind of working relationship with these security consultants. In Ukraine, however, there's none of that dynamic or energy at all, which is so freeing because I have been covering war for a long time, but I'm not one of these people who is like, oh, that's a, you know, 50 cal right there and can tell you every single weapon and every missile. And no, not, not, not my bag. And so it's super helpful to be with someone. I can hear the difference between incoming and outgoing artillery, but I feel a lot more comfortable being with someone who has, you know, fought in wars <laughs> um, for many years and who can really give me a much better sense of how close something is or what they think is going on. And actually, sometimes it's helpful to have their perspective, even just in my assessment of like, OK, we're in Kherson. This offensive doesn't seem to be moving. Why do you think they would be, you know, pushing forces to the left bank here? But because it's a different way of thinking, right? You, to, you, it's a military way of thinking. And so for a number of reasons, I have found it super helpful and, and really a pleasure on many levels working closely with security consultants in Ukraine. Um, we also have armored vehicles. And because at the beginning of the war, one of the biggest issues was that journalists kept getting shot up. They would drive through areas and, 
either they were wooded areas where it was believed that there were kind of Russian forces hunkered down, or sometimes they would flee after a rocket had struck and there would be a kind of chaotic situation at a checkpoint. But this was initially one of the big concerns, certainly for CNN, and I think a lot of journalists, was that that people were just opening fire on press cars and it didn't seem to matter if you had your press or your TV or your whatever stickers in the window. So having armored vehicles, um, you don't need them for every assignment, obviously, but it is, again, it just affords you a, a little bit more comfort. I think that the most chaotic moments of the war were those first, like that first month and no one, you know, every day it would be like a Danish correspondent would come up to me in the hotel and be like, they're going to use thermobaric weapons. And then we go back to you know, the Pentagon or whoever through various, you know, CNN back channels and be like, are they going to use thermobaric weapons? Because now my body armor is not really going to cover me on that one. And, and, and it's incredibly tense and incredibly stressful and really exhausting. And it requires a lot of discipline to stop your imagination from running wild and really try to be disciplined about focusing on like, this is what we know. And this is what we can find out. And this is what we're never going to know. And this is a level of risk that we're just going to have to sit with. And if you make the decision to stay and cover the story, yes, you reassess it multiple times every day, but you make that decision. What becomes dangerous, I think, often in conflict zones is you get into like the the panic mode where like every few minutes you're like, oh my God, this could happen. Or like, oh my God, turn the car around. Or, oh my God, we need to move to another place. And, and it's natural and it's normal. It happens, particularly in the early days when you kind of haven't really got your arm around the dynamics or the routine, because it does settle into a routine. You're like, oh, shelling normally happens this time of night. Oh, Monday mornings, the Russians are going berserk with the drones and the missile attacks, particularly in Kiev. You then you settle into more of a routine and and you feel a little bit more comfortable. But, you know, the best thing that you can do is to have a good team of people, including a security consultant who you trust and to keep a level head to the best of your ability, because it doesn't matter how long you've been covering war for. It's scary. It's scary. It's dramatic. It's unknown. It's incredibly stressful, as I said. So it's really important to be able to try to sit calmly and make a sober assessment that may once again be changing every few hours, but that you don't allow panicked Clarissa to sort of jump behind the drivers, behind the drive, the steering wheel and be like, ah, because that is that is the most dangerous thing you can do in a war zone. And by the way, more war correspondents are killed in car accidents, if you can believe that, than anything else. And there was this great moment, slight tangent, but just allow me, Alex Crawford from Sky News, who's one of the most, I mean, she is the bravest of the brave, was driving into Chernigiv as like shells were raining down on it. And uh, obviously they had to turn around and the driver was understandably putting his foot on the gas. Like, and all you hear Alex Crawford saying, as literally shells are like landing all around the vehicle, is now the last thing we want to do is to get into a car accident. <laughs> and you're like, how on earth did you have the kind of wherewithal? But she's so right. And 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 she's so smart and she's very experienced. So all of which is to say that sometimes it's not the conventional or expected things that you also need to be really uh, cognizant of. There are the much more mundane concerns that far too often become very dangerous for journalists and for people. Look at Stremusov, the number two Russian guy in Kherson, died today, not at the hands of a Ukrainian missile, but uh, in a car accident in Kherson. So, um, yeah, sometimes it's the mundane things you have to be concerned about, too. Well, that captures something that's there, I suppose, in addition to the terror and the horror of war, which is the absurdity uh, of war. Uh, and um, that's that's probably not for us viewers and readers, maybe the most visible aspect. But it's very interesting to hear about that from, you know, sort of firsthand uh, accounts. So I have one 
further sort of serious question, and the final question from our audience is not unserious, but uh, uh, is 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 maybe a little bit lighter in nature. So I'll conclude with uh, with that one. But uh, one further, you know, sort of uh, serious question about covering the war, and I'll start again with with you, Clarissa, and then we can turn to uh, to Josh. And this is the question of of restrictions. Uh, Josh, you mentioned, you know not being able to report about Russia with integrity, or if you were to be in Russia, that it wouldn't be, you know, sort of doable with journalistic integrity. That's obviously a built-in uh, restriction in terms of getting the story out about uh, Russian politics and society. I think, Clarissa, you mentioned as well how difficult it is to get um, uh, good information uh, on Russia. Uh, you know, I do think that Ukraine, in my understanding, has tried to control the narrative in certain ways through certain kinds of restrictions. And I wonder if that's not also the case for the US government in terms of what information is sort of willingly provided and what information may be uh, withheld. I don't mean for nefarious purposes, but just because, you know, sort of secrecy is a, uh, is an important part of, uh, of war. But I'll start with you, Clarissa, if you could sort of reflect on what you think may be the relevant restrictions. I think it's very helpful for us as consumers of news to know about that uh, and to understand what the information environment is um, uh, that you use to, to to draw on for your journalism. So I'll start with you, Clarissa, and then we'll turn to Josh. Um, it's it's absolutely challenging. It's challenging in every war, right? Because it's a natural instinct for warring parties to want to control information and to want to control journalists. And, and, and they love you until they really don't love you. Um, and if you're doing a good job, probably no one loves you. Um, and but in Ukraine, it, that's a tough one. I'm, I'm going to be very candid here because like you you can't afford to lose that relationship in Ukraine. So you do have to accept that you're kind of going to have to work on their terms a little bit. Um, and I think that Josh is 100 percent right in that. I don't think that's a problem as long as you are very transparent about it. Right. The Ukrainians asked us not to mention this. The Ukrainians did not want to show us this. The Ukraine, whatever it might be, tell the viewer, own it, and be upfront about it. And um, I'll give you an example. Recently, we were inv invited, or you know, uh, to tag along as a sort of a swap took place, uh, and it kind of was a swap, but they didn't want to call it a swap, so they were like. You know, we don't want you to talk about the Russian guy who we're giving. We just want you to talk about the other part of it. I'm deliberately trying to be a little bit vague here, but relying on you all not to take Twitter and be like, ah. um, and so I was like, well, you know, we're here and we filmed the Russian. And so I, you can't really put that genie back in the bottle. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a back and forth, honestly, that went on for like eight hours, because basically what had happened is that somebody who probably shouldn't have had given us access to something that people above him definitely would not have given us access to. But once you've already had the access, you can't ask someone, a journalist to like not report on it. And so we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And we ended up in a place that I felt pretty good about. We did report that this, you know, that this Russian guy was released. We didn't use the word swap or exchange, you know, which is like, I mean, you know, you're getting into semantics and I, I, you know, every word we wrote, I stand by, but it illustrates, I think, you know, the sensitivity and the challenge of dealing with this, because this isn't about like, it's not just a question of me being like, well, I'm a journalist and I'll never, ever sacrifice my integrity. This is about someone saying to you, you are going to endanger future swaps. If you report this, those American, you know, that American who's fighting in, in, uh, in, in Ukraine, who got picked up by the Russians, he's not getting out because of you. Now, partly that's like, you know, applying maximum pressure, but partly it's a reminder that as journalists, you have like multiple ethical considerations in your reporting. And there is never a one size fits all answer. And again, it's a conversation that needs to be had by the team. It's a conversation that also needs to be had with management. It's a conversation that at CNN needs to be had with your standards department. Um. But it is a challenge and it is 
I often think to myself, if I was like a 25 year old reporter in this situation, what would I do? Because, you know, now I'm a little more experienced. I am smart enough to know that there are other people who give these issues a lot of thought, who I can call upon to like help make these kinds of decisions. I have better instincts about it, but I have no doubt that there are, there are journalists out there who are probably um, engaging in self-censorship, um, often unwittingly, often, or, you know, or sometimes perhaps, um, willingly because they want access. Um, and that is a tension that you, as I said before, will often see in many conflicts, but it is nonetheless a challenge and something that merits serious consideration and conversation and with the hopes that like you get to a place on an individual level or a team television is always a team where you feel good about the decisions that you make and you feel like you've done the right thing and that you haven't compromised your values so i think a lot of journalists when they start out doing this work they don't even think that like they're going to spend hours thinking about the ethics of some of this stuff which is seemingly a little bit sideways from putting the story out and all the work that that entails, but which is nonetheless a big part of the kind of behind the scenes thinking and conversation around a story. Thank you so much. And and Josh, you know, you, you mentioned a piece you did about ties between the U.S. and the Ukrainian government. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you about restrictions, but also, I mean, it's sort of the inverse of the question. Sometimes it's very interesting, the nature of the information that is shared. Uh, and I'm sometimes surprised by how much information the U.S. government shares, especially about weapons provision to Ukraine. I think that there's uh, there are reasons for that, but it's, it's sort of an interesting question. But uh, just to get your thoughts on restricted information or shared information as it as it, as it sort of shapes the overall story of the war. Right. Um, you know, just as there is a reason why various sides, whether Ukraine, Russia, United States, you know, restricts information or doesn't want information published. There are also reasons why they want that information published, right? So one shouldn't assume that, um, you know, access, uh, that, that the lack of access, you know, has um, political motives or undertones, whereas um, access is somehow kind of pure and allows the journalist to operate. Um, freely um, without being kind of, you know, tainted by the political um, goals or messages of either side, which is of course not true. And I was um, definitely clear eyed in the piece you mentioned about, um, you know, I don't have access to information, unlike say liberated cities in Kharkiv Oblast, which you can get in a car and go to, no one can stop you from doing that. You get out of the car and you go talk to people. And there I felt like I was having an experience that I don't, I don't necessarily want to say was pure, but but it felt um, <laughs> unencumbered. Whereas in writing about weapons supplies from the United States to Ukraine, I can't just show up at the airfield in Poland or Romania or at the U.S. base somewhere, um, you know, in the Midwest and and kind of just secure access for myself and wander around and have a look. I'm I am dependent on people who possess that information to tell it to me. And I'm under no illusions that what they choose to tell and in what um, proportions um, and with what sort of uh, moments accented, that's a choice that uh, has a political element to it. And I'm I'm not naive about that. And I, and I try through some of the same tools I mentioned earlier, time, um, <laughs> getting enough people to talk about uh, you know, sort of different angles or aspects of the same thing that hopefully you develop a composite picture over time. But I'm I'm um, well aware that what people tell you, uh, you know, can have as much a political motive or even taint as what it is that people don't want to tell you. Um, as to how to navigate uh, the sort of restrictions that that Clarissa was talking about, uh, I I also don't have a perfectly calibrated. Um, response or, or equation for how I think about these things, but I, I, I certainly try and delineate between actual operational security and 
narrative security, let's call it like that, right? You know, what actually what actually is credibly going to put people's lives at risk um, and what is just uncomfortable uh, for the various powers that be and they don't want um, aired. And, and I can be extre- extremely flexible um, on the, the former and hope that I'm rarely um, that accommodating on, on the latter, though, of course, the line is blurry and in the heat of the moment, it's not always clear which belongs to which category. Um, but, but not to sound like a, a broken record here, but, but all of this is among one reason. The other is just my own personal proclivities, interests, habits, skills, I hope. Um, but in response to this, I'm definitely conscious about the stories I choose to write and d- am drawn toward the kind of stories that I can just do by showing up. Um, just go to the place and the story is there, maybe not quite for the taking, but with a bit of stubborn uh, persistence and time, you can access it with, with as few middle men and women um, as possible that, that, that you being there, um, you can kind of gin up the contacts, the, the access, the story. And then, um, you know, once you've created that context for yourself can work unencumbered. I, I just greatly prefer that to a story that structurally um, is mediated in some form and, and it, those uh, that mediation is insurmountable. Um, for, for many reasons, that's, those are stories I'm less inclined to take on than, than in the other kind. Well, we've arrived at our, 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 our final question and it's a, it's, it's a nice one considering that one of our ideal audiences for these conversations uh, is students. Uh, and the question is, what it is that you like about your your work? You've spoken, of course, of the trauma of the war, which is you know acutely real, uh, and about the stresses of, of of wartime reporting, and that's all uh, thoroughly persuasive uh, and in its own right uh, moving in terms of the risks that people like the two of you and many others take to to get all of us the story of the war. Uh, but it is also nice to hear. Uh, in the scheme of things, the kind of in the in the big picture sense, what it is that you uh, enjoy about your work. So I'll start with you, Josh, and then Clarissa will give you the last word of today's today's conversation. Uh, I, I hope that um, you know no, my editors aren't listening because I'm about to take a very um, self defeating negotiating position, which is uh, it, it feels like this is work I would want to do for free or, or sort of feel compelled to do even if it wasn't actually a job. Um, I, I say that I think about a lot of the work I've done for the New Yorker over the past years, but, but definitely in the context of this war, um, it has a personal resonance for me. This is an, a, a region um, and, and two countries that I've spent really almost the, the whole, I think would be fair to say, of my professional life um, and, and sort of 10 years full-time devoted to. And, and it's the most... Um, terrible, tragic, but also important and, and kind of mighty in ways um, sort of more um, kind of tragic and, and terrible than than anything else, uh, event that, that's happened um, in, in the area that I've spent all this time, um, not just professionally, but I think with a degree of personal devotion to. And so it, it's, I, I wish none of this was happening, but since it is, I feel a real compel, uh, compulsion to be there. And I'm grateful in a way, I hope you and viewers understand what I mean by that word, um, that I have the opportunity to, to witness this. It, it, it's, it's personally important to me. And, and um, um, it's, it's been tragic and terrible to, to witness, but at the same time, um, been important to me considering what I've, devoted my professional life to so far that um, I'm able to be on the ground and to experience firsthand. It would be very difficult for me to watch from afar this um, tragic and terrible thing take place. And um, I take some, uh, no small degree of, of personal and professional satisfaction, again, with the hope that everyone understands what, what I mean by that word in this context, um, that I'm able to have the opportunity to to be there firsthand. And, and, and Clarissa, in terms of what it is that you uh, enjoy and value about your work. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I, I agree with Josh 100 percent in terms of, 
you know, for me, when I look at my career, it's kind of bookended. Uh, well, I mean, hopefully it's not over, but right for right now, by 9-11 and then the invasion of Ukraine. And, and they're like the two the two stories that I think have like completely changed the world that we live in, in ways that obviously we're only now just starting to um, get our arms around in the case of Ukraine. So it really does feel like a hugely important story. Um, and I, you know, was fortunate enough to live in Russia only for a couple of years in 2007, but I have always felt a very strong attachment and connection to Russia um, so it does feel, and I've covered Ukraine since, uh, well, I first started going there in 2007, but started working there, um, since 2013. So it, I have that same feeling of like personal, like on a very sort of cynical, selfish journalist level, like I would be apoplectic if I was sort of watching from the sidelines and other people were covering and I wasn't there because it does feel personal and it feels vital, Putting that aside in the sort of professional sense, what could be a greater privilege than telling people stories? And especially in a moment where that is so vital, so personal, so painful. To me, that feels like, you know, and I and I often hate it when journalists talk in really like lofty um elevated terms about their own work but like I really do feel like that's something of a sacred duty and and even when it the camera isn't rolling I always if someone comes up to me and they want to talk to me I will take the time and be with them and be present with them and hear their story because I do think that even beyond telling the story part of what we're doing there is being witnesses and being and it, it, the importance for people in war zones to be heard, like that means something to to be able to tell your story and to be able to try to shape meaning out of that story. So it's obviously not perfect, and I don't want to imply that we're you know on on a level with people who are saving lives or anything like that. But it does feel like a really beautiful privilege to be able to do this job and to be able to connect with people who otherwise I would never get to connect with. You know, I always get asked, and particularly since I had kids, oh, wouldn't you rather like have your own show and be in the studio and be an anchor? Why on earth would I want to do that when I get to go and talk to real people <laughs> and be in real situations and 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 force myself to walk in another person's shoes and, and really try to not live vicariously, but to have a much deeper and more personal and intimate understanding of what another person or people or place or culture are going through. So to me, it is the greatest job there is. It is definitely one of the hardest jobs there is it definitely comes with a huge amount of baggage in terms of like your personal life and traveling so much and retaining a lot of the trauma that you witness and and on and on and on and on and on but at its core covering this war has been one of the greatest privileges of my career well, the, the the sun has set. I'm I'm Clarissa in London, and I never quite saw the sun uh, outside of Josh's apartment in 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 Berlin. But uh, the lights of journalistic inquiry are not going out uh, across Europe, and that's uh, in large part because of the work that people like the two of you and 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 of course others are doing to uh, you know to investigate with the kind of care, consideration, and thoroughness that you've just. Uh, talked us through over the last uh, hour or so. So we're just delighted that you, the two of you could join. Uh, for this Monterey conversation, uh, you know it's uh, 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 it's a privilege to get your uh, your sort of thoughts and reflections about the whole enterprise uh, of wartime uh, journalism, and I think it will allow us to to watch and to read uh, the two of you with a uh, with a new set of eyes. So thank you so so much for your time uh, and for your uh, insight, and of course for the for the work that you do. Thank, thank you. you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.